I'm Peter, VK3YE, and uh, have done a little bit of uh, QRP, or low power operating. Um, what is QRP, you might ask? Basically, low power amateur radio. Um, some people have different ideas of it, but you know, generally speaking, under 5 watts of CW, under 10 watts of SSB. Um, um, some might regard QRP as lower than their normal power, like if they're Californians used to running one and a half kilowatts, they might think 100 watts is QRP. But generally speaking, there's QRP clubs and QRP sections in contests and that sort of thing, and, and usually they regard five, 10 watts, or, you know, particularly five watts as QRP. Um, then there's a thing called QRPP, which you might see written down, and that's even lower power. Um, and um, you can do pretty much almost any amateur activity with QRP. Um, and uh, there's some activities that are probably worse with QRP because it can be frustrating under certain conditions. There are some other amateur activities that can be better with QRP because your equipment is, and batteries is lighter, more portable, easier to take. Um, the, uh, some of the reasons um, you can have fun with QRP the challenge of making contacts with low power, if you're used to running 100 watts, 400 watts, um, and making contacts, then uh, it can become a bit less of a challenge after a while. So um, if you've worked DXCC or got awards with high power, some people make it, uh, make it their aim to do the whole thing again, but under lower power. And, uh, yep, yeah, come in. And... Um, yeah, the, uh, uh, n another possibility, another thing that uh, makes QRP fun is homebrew equipment. Um, the elegance of simplicity, the idea of making contacts over hundreds or thousands of kilometres with a transmitter that's only got four or five transistors in it. Um, and with QRP, that's a lot easier because with RF design, a lot of the constraints and problems you have with higher power equipment um, with QRP, you can take a few shortcuts and still get away with it. Um, battery or solar power portable operating, uh, particularly good if you're um, out hiking, you can't cart a generator, you're away from mains power, then QRP is uh, great for that. Then there's awards and activities that are particularly suited for QRP, like summits of the air, national parks, um, where you can take a little QRP rig. Um, weak signal data modes, there's modes like... Um, Whisper, where nearly everyone on there does run QRP because it's so effective, just with five watts or even a few milliwatts. Um, then there's things like HF pedestrian mobile, um, where because you're limited with the, the battery weight and the size of your transceiver, a lot easier with QRP, um, and you can still get some great results. Um, and does it actually work well? Some people say that QRP is no good for SSB and that uh, they, they might say, oh, well, Morse was never my strong point, therefore QRP isn't very um, practical because I'm going to make contacts on SSB. I disagree with that. You can do quite well with QRP with um, SSB. Um, maybe not your 15 to 20,000 kilometre DX contacts, but... It, you can make a lot of contacts up to, say, two or 3,000 kilometres quite easily with QRP on SSB. Um, then, of course, there's the newer digital modes that are um, highly effective with QRP. Um, routine contacts, pretty much any time I go out, I make contacts with QRP, mostly up to about 1,000, maybe sometimes 3,000 kilometres um, with VK6 and ZL. Longer than that's a bit harder, probably... You know, if I tried a bit harder, then I could, um, but I'm not a huge DXer. Um, then uh, you can also have some success with mobile and portable operating, and um, and you might not be so worried about the, the DX stuff. You know, um, with QRP, you can, um, you, know, you know, even a thousand kilometre contact with one watt can be as fulfilling as a uh, um, fifteen thousand kilometre DX contact running high power. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do with QRP. As far as the uh, equipment goes, if you want to try QRP and you don't want to shell out for a dedicated QRP rig first up, then just have a look at your existing 100 watt HF transceiver, wind it down, most of the time you can get it down to 5 watts, so that qualifies you as QRP, 
and um, you can um, uh, work stations QRP. Um, you could either establish contact with 100 watts and then wind down, um, but arguably that's not quite as genuine a QRP contact than if you're starting with 5 watts. Maybe you call a station with 5 watts, see if they hear you, often they will. If, if not, then maybe you can go back up to 100 watts. But the um, 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 thing about that is 100 watt transceiver will have a great receiver, you've got all the features that's got in there, but they do draw a lot of current on transmit, especially with, with QRP. Like, um, they are very inefficient. doesn't matter so much if you're at home and you've got the power supply, but if you're portable, a 100 watt transceiver wound down to QRP, it might draw three or four or five amps even with low power, um, which is not the most efficient if you're on battery power. That's one of the big reasons why a lot of the portable QRPers go for a dedicated QRP rig. Another thing is the weight. A 100 watt transceiver has got all the weight of the, the heat sink and the final amplifier stage and if you want something to cart around then a small dedicated QRP rig is a lot lighter. Um, you can either buy new or used. I'll go through some of the transceiver options later on. Or there's an option of a, uh, a kit, or you can uh, build something from scratch. And uh, tonight there is the um, opportunity for 10 lucky club members to be starting off with building a QRP transceiver like this from scratch. Um, it's a uh, double sideband on 40 metres with a range of up to two or three thousand kilometres on a good day. So, uh, so that's uh, a new club project for uh, people here or others. Um, now we'll uh, talk about um, equipment. Um, most of you have probably seen the FT817. There's a new model called the FT818. Very little difference to the 817. If you've already got the 817, then it's probably it's not worth getting an 818. Um, great thing about it is it's five watts, all modes, 160 metres through to 70 centimetres. So if you're looking for a general purpose QRP rig, then you really can't go wrong. Um, some people say, oh, its receiver isn't so good. And, um, you know, strictly speaking, there are some RF characteristics of its receiver that might not be as good as a, a big home station rig. Not so much of a problem for us here in Australia. Um, we, we don't have too many amateurs close at hand and we don't have, you know, kilowatt power limits, but their receivers aren't quite as strong as some of the other commercially made rigs. But very seldom do I find that a problem in practice. And if you can hear a QR, you know, if you can hear a station on, on there wouldn't be cases, there would be very few cases where you couldn't hear a station on an FT817, but you could on another transceiver. Um, the main thing about it is it does come with an internal battery. The 818 has a somewhat bigger internal battery than the 817, but even so, your the old 817s, they only came with, I think it was a 600 milliamp hour or something, NICAD battery pack, which is pretty pathetic. Um, the amount of um, operating time you'd have on that is not very much. Um, so um, I personally, I use, always use an external battery with, with my FT817. Um, the FT818 does have a better battery. Um, it's still not quite enough. I'll talk about battery capacity and power bu budgets later on. Um, the other good thing about the one good thing about the 818 is it comes as standard a uh, TCXO temperature compensated crystal oscillator, and particularly if you're going to be operating 70 centimeters SSB or digital modes, you do want the frequency to be stable. You want to be on frequency and not. 10 kilohertz off. So, um, yeah, the TCXO is a good um, thing to have. Either it comes with the FT818 or you can buy um, a plug in type and put it in the FT817. And e even the cheap ones from China, which, which I've used, are a lot better than not having a TCXO. So, that's a uh, um, possibility if you already have an FT817. Uh, another benefit of it is you can use it for. Um, you know, as a driver for transverters if you're into microwaves. Um, and value for money is, is pretty good. You know, you have an FT817, you've got pretty much everything. You just need to add an antenna, a battery, an antenna coupler, and you're set. Um, 
so it gives you good performance, it's nice and robust. If any of you have seen my videos, some people uh, recoil at horror of the amount of beach sand that is on the screen of my FT817. Well, it, it keeps going and keeps making contacts. Um, and it's, it's a you know, re reasonably low price. Um, another rig that a lot of QRPers go for is the Ellicraft. There's two models, KX2 or KX3. The KX3 is basically HF. Um, I don't know if it does six metres. Um, the KX2 is a smaller version of the KX3. Um, both are quite expensive. Um, made in America, they are dearer than the FT817. They're less versatile though. They don't have your two metres and 70 centimetres. But if you are a dedicated HF person, then the Ellicraft is probably inherently a better transceiver. I think it goes up to about 10 watts or something on transmit, a bit more than the 817. Um, I think it's got an inbuilt speech processor. Its current consumption on receive is a little bit less, 150, 200 milliamps. Um, so it's, um, and it's got a better receiver. Um, if you, you look at the comparisons of the various receivers, the KX3 is, uh, is pretty good. Um, the uh, um, thing is though that when you look at it, you know, I don't think it's quite as robust as the FT817. You look in it and it's got all these, when I, mean, I saw someone else's, all these holes like you know, Swiss cheese. And if you look after it really well, then that would be fine. But if you take it out on windy, salty beaches and that sort of thing, then I think the FT817 is a bit more robust. Um, but if you really look after your rig, you, you keep it in a nice container and, and don't operate in, in windy and sandy conditions, then the Ellicraft is is possibly a good choice. Um, the other possibilities, um, there's a Chinese one, it does 80 through to 10 metres. It's a bit of a bare bones type rig, only does CW and SSB, it doesn't have AM, it doesn't have 6 metres, 2 metres, 70 centimetres. And if you want to operate for some bands, you need filters, so it's a bit bare bones, it's only got filters for some bands. Um, very mixed reviews, um, if you look at Reviews on you know, a website like Eham um, has reviews from on almost every transceiver that's out there. If you look at eham.net, there's user reviews, and it's very mixed with this particular transceiver. And yet, it is cheaper than the FT817, but in terms of value for money um, and, and warranties and product support, it, it's probably, you know, uh, unless you're on a real budget, then the FT817 would be the better purchase. Um, now, the rigs I've talked about so far are CW and SSB at least. Um, they draw typically about, you know, say, two or 300 milliamps on receive, which isn't bad. A, um, a rig used like a mobile type transceiver would draw more like one to two amps on receive, which is really uh, quite hungry. Um, so 300 milliamps is pretty good, but it's, um, but if, if you wanted something really, really tiny to go mountaineering, if you're away for you know, a few days and you can only take limited batteries, then the possibility is a CW-only transceiver. There's a few, few people here that are into CW quite extensively and something like the LNR MTR series. There's different versions, three, four, and five bands. Um, if they, they're not cheap, they're, they're super light, like you look at them and they're only about the size of a couple of matchboxes and um, it's amazing. They, they don't have a full frequency display, um, um, they, they don't have a sort of tuning knob, it's sort of up and down buttons. So if you're into tuning and doing a lot of listening, then a transceiver with a VFO knob would be um, um, probably better. But if you wanted to keep skids and uh, aren't doing too much tuning, then a small LNR would be uh, great. And the amount of current they draw and the, the size is super compact. So if you really push for space, then a dedicated CW rig like this might be suitable. Um, so um, that's the main commercially available options um, new. Um, used, used, well, back in the 90s, there was an ICOM 703. It looks just like an I ICOM 706, except it was lower power. Um, good rig somewhat heavy, um, high current use. So if you wanted a little rig to use QRP at home, then the 703 would be great. For portable, there's other options. Um, now, some of you might have started with the FT7. Um, 
if you know, there was one on eBay I saw the other day. It was in incredible. Like, I think I, I wanted like five or six hundred dollars or, or something. It's, it's amazing because um, I think you know a lot of people start off with this rig. Um, you know, it came out in the late seventies. Um, they, they might have had fun with CB radio and got their novice license and got an FT7. Um, and I think some of these rigs, because they're sentimental value, people think it's worth a lot. And um, um, you know, it gives good performance. It, it has a um, analog VFO, um, so it may drift. It may not be so good for digital modes where you need the frequency to be stable. Um, it doesn't have much in the way of filtering. It doesn't have digital signal processing. It's also a bit limited with the bands that it covers. It only covers 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10. Um, so if, if you find one cheaply, then it's a good QRP rig, but it is large and heavy um, by today's standards. Back in, in those days, it was quite small and compact. So again, it's a good rig to use from home, but not so much portable. Um, but uh, if, if you've got one gathering dust, then it's, it's a bit of fun to, uh, to fire up once. Um, once the thing. Um, another possibility, if you want to go into homebrew and portable, um, and a great thing about a lot of the homebrew and portable rigs is their current consumption on receive. Um, and for a bit of perspective, a um, mobile type rig might draw maybe one or two amps on receive. An FT817 might draw three or 400 milliamps. Um, a uh, Elecraft KX3 a bit less. Um, I have built receivers, regenerative receivers with you know, two transistors that have heard amateur signals and they have only drawn about two to five milliamps. It is unbelievably low, you know, it's, it's amazing how little current you need to pick up an amateur signal from thousands of kilometers away if you've got a one or two transistor homebrew receiver. So that puts things in a bit more perspective. It's, it's a different angle of QRP. If you look at, uh, you know, the definition of efficiency is basically results achieved over what goes in and if, if you can, uh, you know, if you can achieve something with five milliamps versus something, you know, receiving the same signal on something that draws five amps, then, you know, yeah, it's, you know, um, uh, yeah, certainly quite rewarding. Um, there's a um, design called the BitX from India, designed by uh, Ashar Farhan VU2 ESE. Um, it's available as a kit, um, but it's very almost a pre-built kit. You, you get a circuit board. All of the parts on the board are mounted, which is a good thing for a lot of us because a lot of them are surface mount. Um, it's seven megahertz SSB only. The initial versions of the BitX um, were, had a free running VFO um, and they were a bit unstable, they, they, they drifted. Um, luckily, one, there were ways around it, like if you had a, uh, I think they had a 12 megahertz IF, they used a ladder crystal filter and Luckily, you could get, you might still be able to get them from Rockby Electronics or um, maybe uh, mini kits over in South Australia. Um, ceramic resonators on 4.915 megahertz. And as, as it turns out, a ceramic resonator is like a crystal, but you put a, very, a tuning capacitor in series with it and you can pull its frequency by 100 kilohertz or so. Um, whereas if you were to do it with a crystal, you might only get 10 kilohertz. Um, you can put two crystals in parallel and get a bit more range, but with ceramic resonator, you can pull it by maybe 100 kilohertz. And, uh, and the benefit of that is 12 megahertz minus 4.915 is about 7.085. So you can cover a slab of the 40 meter band if you replaced the free running VFO in a early model of BitX with a, um, a ceramic resonator. And that's what I did, and it was quite successful, very successful. Um, it was really stable. However, if you were to buy the Bitex today, they, um, they did cost, I think, in the past $45 US, which is incredible value for a SSB transceiver on seven megahertz. Um, the thing about it, it was QRP if you ran 12 volts, but if you put a heat sink on it, and ran 24 volts on the final, then you could get about 20 watts. Um, so, so it's an amazing value. Um, however, the one that comes out now, I think, it might, I think it's still 59 US. Um, it's still 40 meters SSB only, but it comes with a DDS VFO. So you've got a digital readout, 
you've got good frequency stability. Um, and the only things you need once you get the kit is, um, it probably takes about an hour or so to get on, on the air, maybe a bit more if you do things properly and put it in a box. Um, you have to do some soldering from the uh, wires coming from the board, you need a volume control. In fact, the volume control that I think comes with it has a very funny knob fitting that it's very hard to get knobs for, but you can just replace it with a normal potentiometer. Um, but if you put it in a metal box or something, then you've got a good portable 40 meter transceiver. Um, gives you quite good performance, good thing to start off with, and yeah, a little bit of soldering and you're on the air. So that, that's a good option if you want a dedicated QRP rig. Um, Micro BitX is more recent, I think that's been out for maybe six months or a year, um, and that is, I think it's about 120 or 150 dollars Australian. Anyway, it's still an amazingly low price for a transceiver that does 80 through to 10 meters. Again, it's a pre-assembled board, uh, DDS type VFO. Um, you need to do a bit of soldering to the components, your things like your antenna socket, your power socket, your speaker and microphone connections. Again, it's a pre-assembled board. It's about you know, 15 centimetres square. But that's another option that you can get a dedicated QRP rig with a little bit of assembly. You can uh, use a bit of creativity to come up with your own box. Um, so that's, that's another possibility to get started on uh, QRP. Um, another possibility is um, there's more other, other kits where you actually solder in the components yourself. They take a bit longer, arguably a bit more rewarding, um, and you can make more modifications. Um, um, of course, we're, we're lucky in Australia we've got QRP kits locally developed. Um, by uh, VK2DOB, and that's uh, OzQRP. And one of the examples of that is a 80 metre, uh, sorry, a 40 metre double sideband transceiver. It's direct conversion receiver. It uses a ceramic resonator on seven megahertz. By itself, it covers, I think, about a 40 kilohertz or so slice of the band. But if you do a modification, um, you can just put a little switch on the front panel and that gives you like an 80 kilohertz range. Um, because it uses a veractor diode with two sections and if you switch one section in and you, you get a, a wider range. Um, it um, takes one or two evenings to build. There's no surface mount parts. It's very simple. Um, costs around $80. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pass it around. Um, and that gives you two watts. Um, it is, unlike the other rigs that I've spoken about, it's double sideband. Um, double sideband suppressed carrier. That means that um, you know, if you're uh, listening to it on an SSB receiver, you can, but you're only hearing half the signal. So it sounds more like a one watt signal instead of a two watt signal. But if you tune someone in on their frequency, then, and they were listening on a normal SSB transceiver, then they wouldn't know that you're transmitting double sideband. So it's completely compatible with SSB. It, has very low current consumption, very good receiver, um, although it is direct conversion, which means that the receiver will be a bit wider than what you're used to, but on 40 metres, that's normally not too much of a problem, um, except during a big contest. Um, so, um, so that's a possibility, if you want something with a bit of personal involvement that you can build and modify yourself. Another possibility um, from OzQRP, um, I haven't actually used, um, use this rig myself, but I've heard them on the air and they sound great, is what they call the MST-3, and that's uh, called Minimalist Sideband Transceiver. It's single band. Um, you can choose which band you want when, when you buy it. It can be between 80, 80 or up to 17 metres. It's SSB and it's 5 watts out. So, um, you know, it's um, you know, a bit more uh, grunt than the OzQRP. It's um, a short form kit, comes with the components. You can get various bits like the VFOs and things. Um, it's for the more advanced builder. I think it costs around $200 if you get all the bits. Um, you do need to find a box for it, unlike the MDT where it comes with the case. So that is an option. Um, there's another one um, that's more recently, um, uh, Hand Summers uh, QRP Labs. It's called the QCX. Um, it's a single band rig. Uh, again, you've got the option of 80 through to 17 metres. 
I'll talk about choice of bands later on. 3 to 5 watts out, CW, um, CW only, but there is the possibility of it being a whisper beacon. That's an option. So if, if you wanted to uh, experiment with weak signal propagation reporter, then you can set your rig up as, as a beacon. And uh, um, it's very low cost, $49. I don't think you would make a profit on that, but um, that's had some good reviews. Um, and that would also have a low current consumption on receive. Um, now, the one at the bottom of the uh, thing, um, it's amazing. You go on eBay and you see these you know, transmitter kits, transceiver kits for like $4, $5, and um, you see lots of them, and they're called the Pixie or the Pixie 2. Um, and, yeah, you can make contacts on them, um, but generally speaking, I would regard them as something that you buy if you want to get a bit of construction experience, if you're learning to solder, um, if, if you want a Morse practice oscillator to transmit across the room, then... Um, um, a pixie is, um, um, you know, might be worth getting. Like, they're so cheap that the value of the, the parts is probably um, more than what you're paying for the whole kit. Even if you wanted to build something else out of the parts, then a pixie is, you know, could be a fun project. Um, what it basically is, it's a 7 megahertz CW transmitter, um, the transceiver. It normally comes with a crystal on 7023. Um, it's Low power, it's less than a half a watt output. Um, so if, there's various things that put you behind with, with QRP. It's, you know, it's 0.5 of a watt output, so it's 10 dB less than 5 watts. Um, it's crystal controlled. Now, I'll talk about this later on, but with crystal controlled, you are relying on other people to find you. Um, so you have to call CQ for ages and ages, and you, you, have, to hope, you have to hope a lot of things. Um, you have to hope the frequency is clear. You have to hope there's, um, you know, no, you know, no one else has taken that frequency or there's not DX interference, and you've got to hope that there's people tuning around and, um, um, to find you. Um, it's also got a direct conversion receiver that's as wide as a barn door. It's not that selective, um, so you'll hear stations 5 or 10 kilohertz or more either side. Um, so as far as a serious transceiver to make contacts, yep, I've made contacts over you know, um, 500 kilometres or so, but it requires everything to be on your side to get contacts. Um, Whereas if you've got a transceiver that's frequency agile, um, like the thing is with the Pixies, there, there might be someone calling CQ 10 kilohertz away from you that um, you can hear them on the edge of your receiver. Um, that nice strong signal, you think you know, they, might, they sh should be able to hear you if you transmit, but you're stuck on this one frequency, so there's no way they'll, they'll hear you if you call. Um, whereas if you had a frequency agile transceiver, you can just change your fre you know, frequency to there and give them a call and chances are you'll make a contact. So the problems with the Pixie is not so much it's low power output, though that's a bit of a hindrance, but the fact that it's fixed frequency. Um, and um, um, But the thing is, there's things, other things I've done with the Pixie, like um, I t I've got a few YouTube videos and on, on my website I, I talk about this. Um, like, I, I've made AM transmitters out of, out of a Pixie. Like, a Pixie has a, um, it's basically a two transistor transmitter. It uses the diode junction of the final transistor as a product detector in the receiver. Um, and then it uses an LM386 chip as the audio amplifier, which provides all the gain in the direct conversion receiver. Now, what you could do, you could um, change it around. So, you instead, of having it as a transceiver on 40 meters that no one's going to hear and work you with, you, you could just for fun, you know, put in a, a different frequency crystal. Um, you could then use the LM386 as a modulator that can modulate the um, drain circuit of the of the FET that's in it, and you can then have a low power AM transmitter out of the Pixie kit. You just need to make a few small changes and you could set it up and transmit AM and I think I had it going once and someone heard it in Tasmania. Um, I had an automated thing that was like a voice beacon. Um, it was modulating this little Pixie. Um, and um, another thing I, I did, I changed the values in as low pass filter and, and got it on 160 meters AM. That's another thing I, I tried with it. Um, Another thing I tried was I put in a ceramic resonator 
um, and I made it frequency agile. So, sure, it's not so good as a transmitter, but you could hear other people on 40 meters. So if you wanted a simple beginner's project for a receiver on 7 megahertz, you could actually get a pixie like this and um, um, get a tuning capacitor, which you can buy from JCAR or get from an old radio, get a ceramic resonator like 7 megahertz. Um, in fact, as, as it happens, um, there'll be some 7 megahertz resonators with this project. So you could put that in the Pixie and, and it could be a really simple beginner receiver for a few dollars. So there's other uses for the Pixie, but don't believe people when they, they say, uh, you know, it's, it's a, you know, yes, you can make contacts, but not for a beginner. Um, there's so many things stacked against you that uh, um, 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 you don't want to get people's expectations too high. Um, in the hands of an experienced operator or where you've got people listening, yeah, maybe, but otherwise. No. Anyway, I'll pass this around. The Pixie that I've got is basically the board that you buy off eBay, plus a few extra parts with a variable crystal oscillator and a, a switch. So you can switch between a crystal so you've got a little bit of frequency agility and then a ceramic resonator where you've got a bit more so you can tune more of 40 meters. So that's an example of a, a, a pixie, what you can do with a pixie. And, and they're so cheap that you might as well buy a few of them and you can have fun, but uh, um, maybe not so much as a uh, uh, serious transceiver. Another possibility is you can build something from scratch. Um, the... Um, um, there's different bands and modes and things you can try, but overall, I'd suggest 40 meters CW or double sideband. Um, given that we're going towards the low part of the sunspot cycle, 80 meters, there's a lot of times when 40 meters, um, you know, you have difficulties in working into Melbourne or whatever, but you can do it on 80 meters, um, either at night or, you know, in uh, twilight hours. So um, if you've got enough room at home for an 80 meter antenna, that's a, a decent choice. Um, you can build a very simple QRP rig, either CW, you can buy crystals quite cheaply, um, although I mentioned how bad crystal control was. If you buy two crystals of the same frequency, put them in parallel and experiment with inductance values in series with them, you can get quite a good pulling range. Um, I've tried it with crystals you can buy quite cheaply for 7030 and you can cover 20 kilohertz or more of 40 meters. So you can actually cover a lot of the CW end of the band. And the more frequency range you can pull your transmitter over, then the more likely you're able to find other people to call and make contacts. Um, like, um, like on the 7025 CW net on Sunday mornings, you can get 7030 crystals, you can pull them down to 7025, and when they QSY, then you, you can probably find a frequency there. Um, another possibility, is a ceramic resonator. You can buy them cheaply on frequencies like 3.58 megahertz. Another frequency is 3.69 or something. Um, I think you can get them from mini kits over in Adelaide. And when you have that with a one transistor oscillator, a buffer stage, you then uh, put it through a, a diode balance modulator and a couple of amplifier stages, you're on the air with a couple of watts on double sideband. Um, so a similar thing to this. Um, the, um, you can start off with building either a transmitter and use your other, another receiver to receive signals on, or a receiver as a beginner's project. Um, so um, um, I'll pass this around. This is a double sideband rig that I've called the Beach 40. It puts out about one to half to two watts, and uh, I've had a lot of contacts on it, um, including into New Zealand and uh, Western Australia. It's frequency agile covers you know, most of the 40 meter band with a ceramic resonator. And it's built to the same circuit as on this handout where you've got the instructions, a circuit diagram, and a ceramic resonator. So you've got the, um, most of the other parts you can get from JCAR. So, um, so, so this would make quite a useful uh, project for someone uh, starting off as a, a building things. Great thing about it is it's frequency agile. You can find people on their frequency and, and call them. Um, it's got a you know, reasonable amount of power output, a couple of watts. When you go to lower powers, I've had contacts with 20 milliwatts on 40 meters SSB. Um, you, can, you can just have an attenuator, connect it to your five watt or one watt transceiver and drop power. And it can be quite amazing with what you can, I, I've worked the John Loyal contest once. I thought, oh, well, I'll do it with you know, 62 milliwatts. And I, and I did, and um, not everyone who you, 
um, will hear you, but you'll get enough, you'll get a few contacts, so that's been a bit of fun. Um, and a direct conversion receiver, which some of the simple QRP rigs, they can be built quite well, um, but the simple ones like in, in the Pixie are pathetically simple. They'll overload, they're unselective, so you can add a few more parts and have it as quite a good performer. Um, and um, the rig like the Beach 40 is probably about the minimum practical QRP rig you could build um, and get good results. Um, as far as batteries, um, personally I use external batteries. You've got options like sealed lead acid, good but heavy, NICAD, lithium polymer. Um, you have to be a bit careful with, um, with some of the ones, you know, um, with shorting and, uh, and, and you know, they can, they can explode and you can have a look on YouTube for videos of batteries. You need to charge them carefully. There are you know, suitable charges you can get that monitor the uh, um, status of all the cells and have a charging regime and all that. Um, but they are very light, and for portable QRP, it's um, um, quite handy. Um, needed battery capacity. How much, how big a battery do you need for your operating? Well, most of the time you're spending on receive. So if you've got a rig that draws a lot on receive, then you're not going to be able to have much operating time. But if you have something like an FT817 um, or a dedicated QRP rig that draws much less, then roughly speaking, um, if, you, uh, if you've got a, I, I would estimate about an hour of operating per amp hour of battery, very roughly. Um, you can draw up a power budget, you can work out how much current your transceiver takes on receive and how much it takes on transmit and estimate your duty cycle. And obviously if you're in active contest making lots of contacts, um, and calling CQ, then you'll draw up more power than if you're on a net and there's eight people on a net and you're listening for 80% of the time. So, um, but generally speaking, a five amp hour battery will have you on the air for around four to five hours. And when I go portable, that's normally enough. Uh, I've normally, uh, you, know, you know, normal portable operating sessions for me, you know, a couple of hours is, is normally enough. So a five amp hour battery is fine for that. Um, the, um, uh, as far as antennas, that's one of the uh, uh, big topics. Um, I can, um, um, you know, some people, you know, the purest QRP is say, oh, well, it's not QRP unless you've also got a pathetic antenna. So, um, yeah, there's, you know, some great antennas down at Kynes and I saw on the way here. Um, but not, if, if you connect a QRP rig up to uh, those antennas, then that's legitimate QRP. Um, um, and, uh, and there are some people that expect fantastic results with them, um, um, but they've got everything against them. They might be only running half a watt. They might be running a crystal controlled pixie transceiver, and they might be running a magnetic loop with 10 dB loss, um, and they might be crystal controlled. So um, no wonder some people get disappointed with QRP. Um, if, if you have all these compromises and they're all cumulative, then uh, especially if you're a new operator, um, um, then, then yeah, you can get poor results and give up. But if you have a, a decent antenna, something that gives you dipole-type performance with QRP, you can do okay. Um, and so if you're starting off with QRP, I'd suggest um, you know, ha have a decent antenna to start off with. Um, it's probably easier to, to start off with antennas that you should avoid. Um, you know, certain antennas that are inherently lossy or difficult to uh, build and they're efficient. Um, it's difficult to have an antenna that's a lot better than a half-wave dipole, but very easy to make one that's inferior. Um, there's no relationship between cost and performance. Some of the commercially made antennas you see advertised you know, might cost hundreds of dollars, but their performance isn't necessarily going to be any better than you know, 20 metres of wire from JCAR. Um, uh, a lot of the times the commercially made antennas are sold and marketed to solve a problem like lack of space and um, yet they might come in a nice bag and all that but they are a comp compromise and they might have a lot of little bits that fall out and um, that sort of thing. Um, and um, they, they might have you know, compromises, they might be... Uh, uh, yeah, examples of um, antennas you, you, that would be significantly worse than a dipole are if, if they're too short, like if you're trying to 
tune up a, a quarter wave antenna or a quarter wave length of wire and you've got a poor ground system, yep, it might tune up with your antenna coupler, it might be one to one SWR, but your performance is likely going to be quite poor. Um, short end feds and verticals, um, you know, antennas with, with traps aren't necessarily efficient um, if, if they're very um, small. If they claim wide bandwidth, then um, and good performance and small size, then you can have two of those things, but not all three. Um, yet you can do quite well with compact antennas if you build them efficient, efficiently. I've had I've worked into Europe with magnetic loops, you know, this big in diameter on 20 meters, and uh, um, so yet yeah, you can get quite good efficiency, but you have to build it well, keep down your ohmic losses, and and your and your you can tell that the losses are low is if your bandwidth is, is narrow. Um, then I'd also distrust antennas with resistors for broadbanding. Um, you know, there's got to be something heating up. Um, antennas I've used, um, generally for casual QRP operating, the easiest to use is half wavelength of wire and an L match. Um, um, a great thing about that sort of thing is you don't need any feed line, which if you want something to put in a backpack, then um, uh, that's a, uh, um, a good thing. You can use multiple, operate on multiple, multiple bands with, the F, with an FT817 um, and a little L-match antenna coupler like this. All it is is uh, a couple of components, a transistor radio tuning capacitor, and if you hold it up to the light, you know, you can see the insides and it's basically a few RF chokes. And, uh, and there's a, uh, a switch where you can have three inductance settings. Um, it's actually, a, um, although it looks like a normal toggle switch, it's a center off switch, which is, they, they're quite expensive from JCAR. I think they're about eight or $9. But the great thing about them is with your center off, you've got, nothing in the switch is connected. So you can have all your inductors in series. And then when you switch at one side, then one inductor is shorted out. And if you switch at the other, another one is shorted out. So you've got three different inductance values, which you, know, you want a reasonable range of inductors. So um, inductance values with an antenna coupler. Um, and if you want something very small, then something like this, which I'll uh, pass along as a, a great little L match for a portable QRP antenna. An end fed half wave, you know, 20 meters or so of wire. On a squid pole, which I didn't bring, but basically you can get poles that um, telescope down to about this tall and go up to about nine meters. Really quite light and uh, great if you're operating somewhere where there's no trees. Um, and um, not, another possibility with antennas, a full wavelength delta loop. Um, now you can adjust its polarization depending on, on where you f feed it. If you have a single pole, you have the point up. If you feed it right down the bottom, then it's horizontally polarized. If you feed it slightly up one side, so it's about a, um, a quarter of the wavelength down and about a twelfth of the wavelength down to the bottom corner, then it's vertically polarized. And if you if you live by the beach like me, then um, you know, you've got lots of piers that you can operate from, you've got salt water, then vertically polarized is, is a, a great approach, especially if you want to work low angle DX, like gray line and, uh, and DX into Europe or whatever, then um, um, vertically polarized is, is good. If you're more interested in you know, short and, or medium distance type communication, like say casual SOTA operating on 40 meters, then a horizontal dipole or NFED would be, would be, would be okay. Um, there's other things you can do. You can use center-fed dipoles. Um, um, they are very efficient if they're fed with coax for a single band. Um, if you want efficient operation on multiple bands, then a link dipole is okay for, say, three or four bands. But then above that, you've got all these little links and connections that and you have to remember which connection you have to short out for whichever band. So. Um, yeah, and not, not so good, especially if you're operating at night and in a contest and want to change bands. Um, if you do want to change bands quickly, then something like a tuned feeded dipole, you can you know, either use the slotted type, you know, if you can still get it, you might still have a roll of it, um, a 300 ohm ribbon, or you can make your own um, feed line from just from bits of wire and uh, this parallel. And then you use a balanced antenna coupler, which um, I, I didn't bring, but... Um, uh, that can give you multiple bands and efficient performance over about a, a two and a half or three to one frequency range. The, um, 
radiation pattern changes uh, a bit at the top end of the range that you're using and down at the bottom end it's um, less than 3 eighths of a wavelength so it becomes inefficient but if you've got like a 40 meter dipole with tuned feeders and you've got a um, antenna coupler then that will work fine on 30 meters 17 20 meters um, on quite a good range of bands um, so um, um, as far as um, passing around from there the smaller antenna coupler the main limitation with that smaller one is that it's um, only um, does 40 meters through to 10 meters increasingly as the sunspots go down 80 meters will start to be good and even if you're a little bit compromised with antennas then close in stuff like 200 kilometers then 80 meters is um, um, good so what I did um, this is another antenna coupler um, that has some extra switches so the idea is you've got switches um, that short circuit unwanted inductors there's four toroids four different um, settings so you've got I think there's inductance values of one microhenry two microhenry four microhenry and eight microhenry so you can go up in one microhenry steps I think it's two to the power of three or it's two to the power of four anyway there's quite a number of different inductance combinations and that's better than say a rotary switch that might only have four or five combinations because you can match a variety of wire lengths on a variety of bands and um, um, that antenna coupler will work on you know uh, between 80 and 10 meters only recently did i realize hey i needed some more um, things for 80 meters so i converted it and put in a bigger inductor to do that um, so overall an antenna coupler like that is less space than taking coax cable so for portable operating I'd, I'd recommend that approach um, as for antenna materials um, I mentioned the squid poles um, they have revolutionized portable QRP um, you can get an antenna up at a reasonable height um, Haverford's in Sydney um, is um, they even actually mention amateur radio as an application for their poles so you can order them online and you can get like a, a nine meter pole is, is a good place to start if you want something the other thing with nine meters is it's nearly a quarter wavelength on 40 meters so you could set it up as a vertical you could even um, have a, a trap in the middle of it for 80 meters and if you've got a good ground then that's a possibility if you've got limited space or if you want to operate from home or on a salt water environment um, there's other materials that are great um, with although if you're building a um, home station antenna then obviously you want it to stay up as long as possible but portable QRP you've got different priorities um, it has to be light it doesn't have to be so durable as you're only having it up for a short time so you can use other material like irrigation tubing um, can be useful fishing line velcro strip you can get it on eBay the thin hookup wire like this is fine um, uh, as you're only dealing with low power um, there's different lengths of telescoping squid poles if you want something if you're traveling by air and want something compact then you can get squid poles that only collapse down to you know, about 60 or so centimeters which is a bit better for luggage and they will extend up to about five meters so that's a quarter wavelength that you could use as the basis of a quarter wavelength vertical on 20 meters so, so that could be okay um, as far as with, with QRP stuff the basic philosophy is getting results with the minimum of expense power and stuff so I tend to take as little as possible um, you, you've got to question all of what you take like does it add to your signal or not if it doesn't add to your signal leave it at home um, things like automatic antenna couplers um, I've personally um, you know the thing is with a, a manual antenna coupler is you get a bit of a feel for how sharp an antenna is and um, and when you're making adjustments um, an automatic antenna coupler it's one other thing that has batteries and, um, and and potential problems and moving parts so I just go with a simple manual antenna coupler even things like Morse keys if you can get away with an up and down key then uh, you probably won't be sending all that fast with QRP um, probably no more than 20 words a minute um, you know, 15 words a minute typical so you can do that with an up and down key um, you can save a bit of weight with lightweight plastic variable capacitors which you wouldn't run to use with um, higher power um, um, so yes yeah, supporting the antenna usually fishing line um, 
You can just have squid poles. Um, another thing I've tried is, uh, is squid poles. It's a good idea sometimes to get two squid poles. So then, particularly on 80 meters, um, I like using NFET half wavelengths of wire. Um, so you need about 40 meters of wire on 80 meters to do that. But the problem with that is that if you've only got a single squid pole, then your average height is going to be very low. So it's a good idea to have a couple of um, squid poles to have the antenna reasonably high over the length of that 40 metre length. Yep, there's a bit of droop down, but it's, it's far better than, than most of it being in the bushes, which would be the case if you just had one pole. Another possibility is kite antennas, and uh, I've had some incredible results on 160 metres AM. Um, if you can, um, you know, um, there's different kites you can use. I like the type, I think it's called, it might be called a box delta kite, but it's almost like a box kite, but it's got wings on it and sort of a triangle um, type thing. There's a few videos on my YouTube channel about all that. Um, but yeah, um, you, you will have amazing signals for that. You can, um, if you have a kite antenna, you can basically set up a station that's as good as people with big towers and things. Um, and you're vertically polarised on a band like 160 metres, so you can get some great results. Um, um, some, I, the longest I've had a kite up in the air for continuously without my attention has been 40 or 50 minutes. If you had really good kites, you might be able to, you know, there's quite an art of kite flying. Do that, but generally speaking, it's probably better if you've got two people, one to do the radio contacts and one to look after the kite. Um, as far as matching the antenna, I've spoken about antenna couplers. Um, and the great thing about that is that can make a bit of wire like this work on multiple bands. But if you're only interested in a smaller number of bands, some people used fixed ratio type broadband transformers because an NFET half wavelength of wire like this on 40 metres is high impedance. It's around 3,000 or 4,000 ohm, which means if you plug it straight into your 50 ohm output of your transceiver, it's not going to be any good unless you have a, a coupler like that or some other uh, transformer. Um, another possibility, if you wanted to save space, an L-match, you could build that into the back of a QRP transceiver. You could just have a tuning capacitor and a fixed um, inductance. Um, that's okay if you're only going to be using one type of antenna with, with your transceiver, like an NFED half-wave. Otherwise, it's a good idea to have switchable inductance. Um, so, um, uh, as far as making contacts and, uh, you know, the other thing, um, some people don't have a lot of success. I, I mentioned that with something like a Pixie, all the things are probably going to be stacked against you. You're running very low power. You're not frequency agile. You've got a bad receiver. Um, and a lot of people aren't necessarily, you know, that they might think, oh, 20 metres, it's a great band. I can work DX, but... You know, wrong time of day. It's, there's only a few hours of the day. There might be times when, you know, with 100 watts or 1,000 watts, you might be able to work DX for, say, four or five hours of the day. With QRP, it might only be one hour of the, one hour of the day around sunrise and sunset. So your timing is a bit more critical. Um, um, good idea is to tune the band first to get an idea of the general conditions um, and where it's open to. Take note of beacons. Um, there's some great beacons on uh, 20 metres, um, 17, 15, up to 10 metres. Um, the International Beacon Project beacons, they're all around the world, and they are set up so they transmit on 100 watts first of all, then they go down to 10 watts, then they go down to 1 watt, and then they go down to 100 milliwatts. And there's times um, when and they, they identify and they're all on the one frequency, and there's one beacon transmitting on the one frequency all the time. So you can listen and you hear, and the beacons are arranged so that they are in time sequence of where they are around the world. So you've got the ZL beacon, and then you've got one in VK6, and then there's probably one in India or something. It goes, goes around the world. So you can hear just by listening to that one frequency for about 10 minutes where a band is open to like 20 metres. And then you hear it, it's sent to dash at 100 watts, and you can often hear it's, you know, it at its one watt power level, um, depending on, um, you know, you, you, know, you certainly often hear it at, at 10 watts, and they are just using basic vertical type antennas. So the international beacons gives you an idea as, as to the conditions. Um, another thing as well, it's worth, when you're tuning around the band, you hear people um, on air, particularly a band like, um, you know, you listen for stations calling CQ. Um, 
or those about to finish a contact, or if they're making very quick contacts. All of those three things are opportunities for you to get in there um, when you know that someone's listening, give the station a call and get a contact. Um, when a contact's about to end, um, um, it's called tail ending when you give them a call. The great thing about it is that the chances are that someone on that frequency will still be listening um, you know, 10, 15, 20 seconds after they've uh, finished the contact. Whereas if you call CQ on a random frequency, you are relying on people that actually to actually hear you. Not only that, but also to decode your call sign. Conditions might be varying up and down. Some people might have a lot of high local noise level. They might only, they might think, oh, well, since the guy who's calling CQ is very weak and I'm going to hardly hear his call sign, then I will also be weak. They'll assume that they're running 100 watts. Therefore, they're not going to necessarily going to bother replying to a CQ call from a, a QRP station. So most, a lot of the contacts with QRP are made by calling other stations. Um, really important um, operating technique. Um, so it's by tuning across the band, being aware of what's on, um, and eventually you get, get an idea of, uh, of people's operating practices. And when you give them a call, you try and, you know, you need to be absolutely sure they have finished and not be stomping over someone because uh, the chances are other people will be stronger than you. So timing is really important in, in contacts. Um, having said that, you can still call CQ with success. You could make up an automatic CQ caller, um, either get your computer or, or, or something. You can use an Arduino thing to call automatic CQ on CW um, and have that going. Um, but yeah, um, calling others is really important. As far as um, getting the um, when you do establish contact, first thing is you get the call signs across first. A contact is not a valid contact unless they have your call sign right. And even if they might, they themselves might give all this other information about them, um, don't go any further until they've got your call sign right. Then you repeat it very slowly in phonetics and, um, and then you move on to the next thing, like your name and you know, a signal report is the next thing, um, then your name and location. But you do have to be sensitive of conditions. If signals are fading up and down, or if they're not getting a strong signal from you, maybe because of their local noise, then uh, um, you have to make sure your operating procedure is sympathetic to that. You, you don't want to subject them to your weak signal going on and on and on and they're not hearing much from it. So get the basics across first and if conditions are good, if they're getting a strong signal from you, then you can talk further. Um, the, uh, um, and even contests. Contests might be you know, things that are high power thing, um, things, but often contests are opportunities where you've got portable club stations at quite locations like this and they will often hear you on QRP and as it's only a short contact, they just want to rack up the points. So a contest is a good way to make contacts, even with QRP. As for conditions, people talk about, oh, this is the worst sunspot low. Um, you, know, you know, conditions have never been this bad. You, you hear all these people on the band. Well, I started in radio, you know, 30 years ago, and they said exactly the same thing in 1986, and they said exactly the same thing in 1996. Every sunspot low, you have people that even though they've been licensed for 50 years or whatever, say so this is the worst sunspot trough and they can't all be right. Um, but even if the sunspot numbers are, are down, you can still make contacts with QRP. Um, you do have to change your expectations. Maybe you have to change um, what you consider a success. Maybe working, instead of working 15,000 kilometres with five watts, maybe you could try working 3,000 kilometres with 100 milliwatts. Um, that might actually be easier. Um, and... Um, you know, it's, it's, I find it's quite easy to make contacts you know, up to your, you know, like VK6ZL with you know, QRP power levels. Um, um, you can chase things like the grey line on 40 metres early in the morning and work into Europe. Um, but yeah, um, you can still do quite well with QRP. Um, digital modes is a possibility as well. Um, um, and there are a lot of things that are not affected by the sunspot cycle at all. Um, like uh, bands like 80 metres and 40 metres, you can still work DX even if the sunspot number is zero. During the middle of summer, sporadic E, fantastic. Um, 
I've, you know, I've got a little loop that's about this big. It's a magnetic loop. And um, whenever there's you know, sporadic e-opening, I just take it with the FT817, a little over-the-shoulder bag, and run down to the beach and uh, have, have contacts, um, you know, you know, 1,000 to uh, 2,000 kilometres. And this last sporadic E season from November to about you know, January, it's been fantastic. Um, some people say that sporadic E conditions are, you know, if anything, better in low sunspot um, years. So um, yeah, sporadic E is fantastic on 10 and 6 metres. So uh, if you've got something like an FT817, make up a little magnetic loop and go pedestrian mobile and you can have some fantastic contacts. And the other thing is you've got VHF, UHF and microwaves. You can uh, run low power um, and, um, and that's not affected by the sunspot cycle either. Um, you can do aircraft enhancement. I've worked into Canberra you know, just with a four element Yagi and five watts on two metres. Um, and I, I don't think conditions are particularly enhanced but you know, the plane's flying over at the right time and the other station at the other end had a good station. He could hear your QRP signal. Um, there's other things you can do, like you can, you know, another time I was at Oliver's Hill at Frankston where it's got a bad takeoff towards Tasmania, but I could beam towards Mount Dandenong, bounce my signal off that and work a guy in Tasmania on two metres. Um, um, yeah, he was on SSB. It was difficult for him to hear me, so... Luckily, he knew CW, so I just sent CW and he got the call sign across and we had a, a cross-mode contact. So that's another thing you could do um, there. Um, another thing I have a bit of fun with is HF pedestrian mobile. Um, um, basically, two antennas I use for that, either a magnetic loop or a vertical. Um, even though, yes, you are having to carry everything, on the lower HF bands, there's issues with antennas and all that. But 40 metres is surprisingly good. Um, um, you can ha easily have contacts out to 1,000, even 3,000 kilometres. I've worked ZLs on SSB with 5 watts pedestrian mobile. Um, 20, uh, 20 metres, I've worked into Europe uh, pedestrian mobile. This is just with the FT817 and a magnetic loop, um, just hand carried. Um, but 20 metres tends to be a bit more competitive. Um, there can be other stations there. So even though your antenna might technically be more efficient on 20 metres, I find 40 metres has been the most enjoyable band for pedestrian mobile, even though the antenna might only be this big. It's electrically small, but it's a, you know, efficient enough to have contacts. Um, the uh, 10 metres and 6 metres, fantastic bands for pedestrian mobile during the sporadic E season. Other times you might not hear anyone on, but summer is fantastic and even two metres SSB. Um, there's some SSB nets in, in Melbourne that um, you know, probably a bit far from here, but uh, I've had contacts. Um, with pedestrian mobile, basically two choices of antennas. A magnetic loop, you can build a magnetic loop about 90 centimetres in diameter. You can get all the parts from Bunnings, except for the air-spaced variable capacitor, which you, know, you can get from a valve radio or whatever. Um, look out for them at the next ham fest. And that can operate on all bands from 40 metres through to 30 metres. And, uh, um, and that's probably overall the best, uh, good pedestrian mobile antenna you know, if you're here. Uh, if you live near the beach like me, then a vertical antenna is, is great. Um, I've got one that's on a squid pole, so it's a five metre long wire vertical, just this type of hookup wire. And with a small antenna coupler at the antenna socket of the FT817, it um, uses a... Um, um, I've had some great results, um, worked into VK6 in New Zealand, and it will operate on, on all bands from 40 metres through to 6 metres. Um, you can change bands um, provided uh, on the, from 10 megahertz through to 50 megahertz. You don't even need to make any adjustments to the antenna itself. You just adjust the antenna coupler and tune yourself in. Um, I've had some great contacts, but the thing is about that is you need a good ground, and I do that. I have a uh, aluminium a bit of aluminium that I have around my ankle and I have to be in ankle to knee deep salt water for it to work. Then you'll get some uh, great contacts. As soon as you walk out of the water, it, it drops off. So um, um, if you're not near salt water, then this type of antenna is not that efficient, particularly in the lower HF bands, whereas this one is much less dependent on ground. So around here, a loop like this is probably a good choice. And there's also some other uses like for receiving. And if you wanted something a little bit smaller, then a 40 centimetre diameter loop, 
can cover 21 to 50 megahertz. So during, on, during the summer when I don't want to take a big unwieldy loop, I take the smaller loop and work 6 and 10 metres pedestrian mobile. Um, so um, yeah, that's the... Uh, um, um, so that's one of the things you can do with, with QRP. I've mentioned uh, building equipment, either designing it yourself or building a, a kit. Um, you can go with even lower power. Um, you can just build a attenuator, just a box of a few switches and a few resistors, and you can calculate the values um, on the web. You know, look up pi attenuator or T attenuator, and you can have a box, and you can go down to... Um, um, I've got an FT, the FT817, its lowest power output is 500 milliwatts. Um, so you can just go down to half a watt if you want. But a lot of the time, people can still hear you with 500 milliwatts. So with your attenuator, you just, um, you know, I've one on the switch position to 7 dB, so that can get you down to 100 milliwatts. And then there's another position where it's uh, another 7 dB, so 20, 20 milliwatts. And, you know, people can still hear you, especially if they are at low noise locations. Um, and one of the great things about QRP is if you go portable, especially on the weekends, there's a lot of people on summits of the air that you can work and they will often hear you, even at low power levels. Um, so yeah, um, so to summarise, uh, QRP is a whole lot of fun. It works with pretty much all facets of amateur radio. Um, the equipment is plentiful and cheap. It's probably cheaper now than it ever has been. Um, but the operating technique is important. You need to operate so you maximise your chance of success, which means picking frequencies that people are listening to, like tail ending after contacts. And there's a, a variety of activities. Um, even during times when other people complain the sunspots are bad, there's no DX or whatever. Um, there's other things you can do um, with QRP that aren't affected. Further information, um, there's a couple of, um, uh, there's my website, vk3y.com, um, and my YouTube channel, um, just type in my call sign. Um, there's also um, this talk in a bit more detail is in a book called Minimum QRP. It's a ebook um, uh, available, you can get it on your Kindle, and uh, around $6 each. So if you have a look on my website and follow the link to that, or um, jump on Amazon, um, then you'll be able to find it there and uh, download it. And uh, that's you know, about 40 or 50,000 words, so it's quite a bit longer than this talk and gives you, uh, elaborates a lot more in the equipment, the operating technique, the antennas. There's another one um, called Hand Carried QRP Antennas. It's a similar ebook um, that just concentrates on the antennas. There's quite a lot of projects there antennas, antenna couplers, and um, a few other books. Um, there's one called Getting Back Into Amateur Radio, 99 Things You Can Do With Amateur Radio, um, which are um, um, available. And overall, about 7,000 of the books total have sold all over the world. So they've been fairly popular. Uh, have a look at the reviews and what people say about them. Um, uh, another thing I'd, I'd highly recommend is uh, the VK QRP Club. Um, they put out a magazine four times a year, cost you $15 a, um, per annum, and uh, they have a lot of little circuits. They also sponsor some QRP contests. Just recently, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, um, they did an 80 metre contest, and that was very popular and worked a lot of stations there. So uh, um, I recommend, if you're interested in this at all, the VK QRP Club. If you're more interested in little circuits and things, there's Sprat Magazine from the GQRP Club. It's quite cheap. I think it's about $24 a year Australian or something, but you get this magazine, you know, you know, full of little circuits and things with simple QRP rigs, so that's uh, a good thing to get. Um, also, a lot of YouTube videos and websites. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, um, um, pretty much uh, my, my take. Um, we've got a little bit of time for questions, so uh, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Is it worth mentioning QRP in your call sign? Personally, I don't. I know some, some people do. In a QRP contest or where there's QRP sections, yes, you do. Um, if you do, you never sign on CW slash QRP because you know, slash means you know, something makes it part of your call sign and QRP isn't. Uh, overall, if you say things slow and as little information as possible, then um, 
you know, personally, I would say that the more information you send, the worse it is if signal levels are poor. On the other hand, some people say that, oh, QRP is, sounds distinctive, and you know, you some, sometimes hear people on, on there saying, QRP, QRP, without announcing their call sign. Personally, I think that's a bit like begging, like the, the begging, poor me, I'm QRP, and all that, please help me, please look, you know, have mercy, and all that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, Personally, I, I don't. Yet, yeah, yeah, sure, you tell people your QRP once you've, you know, you've made contact with them. But <sighs> there is different, different views. Um, so yeah, um, some some people do, some people don't. So uh, yeah. Um, uh, any other questions? Have you experimented with nickel metal hydride batteries? Y yes. Yeah, they, they, they're good. Uh, you get more amp hours you know, compared with NICADs. Um, they've got slightly higher internal resistance, but for QRP purposes, that's, that's fine because you're not drawing too much current. So, yeah, um, they're simple to charge. So um, they're not quite as light per power unit of power as some of the lithium-based batteries, but, yeah, no, they, they're a good choice. Thank you very much. Mm. Um, yeah. On behalf of the yeah. um, yeah. for giving us such an excellent talk. Yeah. And Ross, I Ross. Uh, uh, just, just want to know, uh, with magnetic loop antenna, mm. uh, do you need a special kind of uh, antenna, antenna coupler because the impedance is different? No, no, don't use an antenna coupler at all because um, you've just got your tuning capacitor at the top of the loop. Um, that brings it to resonance, and as far as you have 50 ohms, you just feed it with 50 ohms coax. Now, depending on the type of magnetic loop, you can either use a there's a smaller loop inside it, um, which is about a fifth the diameter of the bigger loop, that works okay, or you can tap it off like a gamma match, but no capacitor. You, you normally have the center of the coax cable. Um, in fact, I'll draw your diagram here. You've got the uh, magnetic loop like that. You, you just have the um, braid of the coax cable connected down here and then you have the inner of the cable tapped off there and you, you'll, you should be able to find a point where at all the frequency range of the magnetic loop that will it'll give you one to one SWR if you tune this right. So you can just feed it with 50 ohm coax and, um, and that's good enough. No, I wouldn't use an antenna coupler with a magnetic loop. Um, Unless, if you had a case where you were slightly off frequency, if you had a magnetic loop outside or whatever, you're a bit off frequency, then you could probably chew, have a, a coupler at, at the bottom, but I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't bother with it. Any more questions there? Um, that, oh, sorry, I missed that before. Um, thanks very much, Peter, yep. for an excellent talk. And, uh, a lot of information to take in, mm. and I, I think uh, there'll be a few people experimenting mm. with um, QRP. And don't forget that we've got, um, you know, there, there are 10 instructions, um, ceramic resonators, and uh, circuit diagrams for a double sideband transceiver. So it only takes, you know, maybe you might be able to build one in a weekend or, you know, a few evenings, and uh, you can get on the air. There's a lot, people have built them all around the world, and there's further information on my website about, you know, a bit more detail. So uh, maybe as a, as a club project, uh, it's it's available to uh, um, there's ten here for the club. Mm. Yeah. And if you, if you need any more resonators, you know, let let me know. There's a few more.